The problem with just looking at it in terms of numbers, though, is that it doesn't actually get to the heart of why representation matters, right? We aren't necessarily saying that video games should reflect the U.S. census. For one, video games are not just played in the U.S., nor are they made in the U.S., in, in all made in the U.S., obviously. Um, the idea that representation should somehow reflect numerically the real world as we know it assumes a very sort of static notion of what identity and representation might mean. Instead, I like to turn to film scholar Richard Dyer's understanding of why representation matters. He argues, quote, how we are seen determines in part how we are treated. How we treat others is based on how we see them. Such seeing comes from representation. Representation is a way of providing us with imaginaries for what is and might be possible in the world beyond what good or bad characters um, might be in those games. At its most basic, diversity is about having more types of people in games. That includes race, gender, sexuality, class positions, people with various forms of embodiment, neurodiversity, religions, nationalities, politics. But it also means more kinds of stories, more kinds of games, more kinds of things to do in these games. And yet, a lot of our models for diversity, if you Google image search diversity, assume a single text should be all things to all people. It assumes a sort of Benetton ad approach to representation. One of my uh, former interviewees referred to it as the Burger King Kids Club approach to representation, where you just have one of everything and then everyone should be happy. Um, we might update it to say, I don't know, the Glee approach to representation, a Benetton ad for representation. You can insert whatever uh, nice cliche you, you wish. Another way of thinking about diversity, though, is by considering the broader sphere of production in which games exist. This is a, uh, from a gamer, Maxi Bryce Bites, who I follow on Twitter. Who I think uh, this image sums it up pretty well. More options are needed because so many people play games. And we should never confuse the fact that people play the same kinds of games over and over as evidence that that's all they would play if they weren't, if they weren't given more options. Another game researcher, T.L. Taylor, put it best, I think, when she said, people don't know what they could like. Um, and they only know what they've liked or not liked about what they've experienced so far. And rather than just having a multi-flavored single cheesecake, maybe we can have more kinds of cheesecake in general. For those of you who have not had dinner yet, this is probably a very cool image to show. For my own research, way back in 2006, when I was but a wee, uh, graduate student in my first year. I wanted to get a sense of why what other people who like me enjoy games but weren't being represented in games felt about that lack of representation. And so I did a virtual ethnography with a group of LGBTQ gamers um, and asked them questions about representation as well as looking at their forum discussions around questions of representation. And I found that many of them did not care about representation. They assumed it would come in time, they assumed that eventually the, market, the marketers would recognize a gay gamer niche in the way they had recognized uh, gay uh, media niches in things like television and film. A lot of it um, I made sense of because a lot of them played online and homophobia in online spaces was much more important to them than questions of representation in the games themselves. But also, they had lots of ways of finding queerness in games beyond what might be expected representation. They certainly shared representations of queerness in games when they found them, but it wasn't why they necessarily played or what they necessarily sought out in playing. Um, my studies of gaming in the Middle East, Finland, and India kept, uh, as, work with, as well as work with female gamers in the US generated very similar themes. Over and over again, people kept telling me that they just didn't care that much about having their group whatever that group might be represented in games, if they, even if they cared about representation in other media. Now, as a first-year graduate student, this was a bit defeating, because that was what I had gone to graduate school to do. Um, but rather than assume that either they were wrong or I had flushed my life down the toilet, I decided to look more deeply into it. I could have easily dismissed it as a desirability effect, attributing it to cognitive dissonance or false consciousness or any other number of jargony academic terms, but those seemed both uninteresting to me as well as unethical. Instead, I took a position I had learned from feminist ethnographic media scholarship. I took my interviewees at their word, and I set, to rec set out to reconcile scholars' compelling uh, research demonstrating the importance of representation with people's, um, or the audience I had been interviewing, relative ambivalence around questions of representation and I asked, what does a call for representation look like when we take both seriously? In exploring that question, I realized I recognized myself and my participants in a lot of ways. Um, 
I too grew up playing a medium for which I was not the primary market. I am consuming media in which only certain aspects of my identity were ever shown. I recognize their ambivalence as a sort of coping mechanism, which push back against uh, attempts to make them responsible for their own inclusion. If the logic goes that I need to make myself knowable as a market in order to be represented in a medium I wish to consume, it is easier to not care than it is to articulate what I want, especially if, I'm, if I've never had the experience of getting what I want from representation. And beginning from that, uh, Gaming at the Edge explores how media scholars and media producers might talk about the politics of representation in new ways. How do we talk about representation in a way that can embrace intersectional and hybrid identities? How do we uh, demand representation without raising the specter of niche marketing? And how do we talk about representation from an audience-centric perspective? I was also worried that in past research, I'd focus too much on recruiting people as uh, members of particular groups, and that they felt the pressure to and were resisting the pressure to answer as members of those groups. Um, so in, in this project that informs the book, I used an online survey to recruit blame players of all types and then selected from those people who identified outside of the white male heterosexual US gamer construction. This was done in part because a lot of the previous research suggested that marginalized groups would have a particular investment in representation, something my own research had called into question. This diagram shows sort of the array of interviewees, though I want to be clear that the lines between these groups are not uh, meant to be stable. Devin, for instance, um, is half Cuban and half uh, German, um, grew up in Miami where he was the gringo in, in the neighborhood because he didn't speak Spanish. And then when he moved to Philadelphia, people kept telling him he wasn't white, he was Spanish. His own identity didn't change, but the way people approached his racial identity did over time. Um, I think that the Venn diagram is really just a useful way to situate people at the intersections of multiple identities to help make sense of um, I, their identities in a way that doesn't privilege gender over race over sexuality. And I want to be clear that although I started people, with people who are members of particular groups, it wasn't to make claims about those groups in particular. Rather, the aim was to look at how members of marginalized groups discuss the importance of representation and their own connection to game texts. That is to say, I didn't start with the assumption that the categories of race, gender, and sexuality would matter to them, um, or that being marginalized in some way would shape their media consumption. One of my entry points into getting my interviews to talk about their relationship to games and other media was through the question of identification and in asking them about what identification meant to them if they identified with the game and other media characters. And I discovered a few interesting distinctions. First was they often distinguished between identifying as a member of a particular group and identifying with a character in a, in a media text, whether that's a TV show or a game. Um, in addition, they often articulated a very clear distinction between interactivity and identification. And despite the sort of common rhetoric that people identify more with characters because they're playing as those characters, a lot of my interviews suggested that that wasn't actually the case. Um, often the interactivity of the game might trump their ability to identify with the character on the screen. Um, for interviewees, identification required finding a character who they could see some aspect of themselves in, and it was always described as sort of a distanced act, both seeing something in that character, but also feeling separate from that character. And very specifically, as um, Christine puts it, not just being a woman or something like that, just a connection based on similar interests and goals and values in life. And actually one of the things that I find a lot that I haven't uh, sort of pulled out and written a separate section on is that Humor was by far the number one thing people brought up as a way they found to, I, the way they identified with characters. It had very less to do with sort of surface level uh, demographic categories than it did. Does this, people, this person tell the same sort of jokes I would tell? Do they laugh at the same sorts of jokes I would laugh at? Um, or as Kat explains it, identification with a character is, isn't just about identifying as a member of the same group as them. She says, I would be able to identify with a 50-year-old black man who was also from Georgia and also went to my high school much more than I would be able to identify with a 20-year-old white female who lived in Canada, no offense Canadians, and was like a scientist or engineer and I couldn't relate to on a personal or social level. I think that common geography and common history bonds people. Or as Evan put it in relation to Mario Brothers, the neighborhood I grew up in was all Italian-American, but I didn't even get that Mario and Luigi. It wasn't like, oh, Italian-American, middle-class pump plumbers, that's just like my family. It was more, it wasn't like that. It was just fun and colorful. And related to that, 
interviews made a distinction between um, the interactivity of games, games and the ability to identify with characters on the screen. Here Julia is talking about Kratos and the game's God of War, who could be a bunny rabbit for all she cares. He's just holding the knives. Or, Malcolm, or as Malcolm described, games are sometimes so interactively involving that there isn't really space for identification in a more distanced way that my interviewees described it. There's too much going on on the screen to think about what your character is thinking or feeling. When it comes to whether or not identification really matters, responses vary greatly. Um, for most interviewees, identification um, Oh, sorry, skipping ahead. Perhaps it shaped more than what they won't consume rather than what they seek out. For example, uh, Kane wouldn't play games like Grand Theft Auto or wouldn't read books where there's a sort of despicable protagonist because he didn't want to see the world from those characters' perspectives. It also, people can I also identify with, uh, enjoy things that they don't identify with. For example, Malcolm, who was a man from Southeast Asia, really loved the show Girlfriends. Um, which is about four African-American women. And he said, absolutely no identification, as you would say, for me. Now, granted, they were attractive, but there's no sort of a TV shows with attractive people on them. It's just that it was so well-written and so amusing, humor again, right, that I would watch it on a regular basis, even though I had no identification with that. For most interviewees, identification, like representation, was nice when it happens. Um, nice, I argue in the book, is more than ambivalence or apathy that it seemed like it was in my previous research. I felt, in a lot of ways, it was sort of a defense mechanism, a pushback on being held responsible for one's own marginality. Rather than actively seeking out representation, you could just be happy when it came to you. But if you're seeking it out, it presumes that there's something specific that you're looking for, and they didn't want to be called upon to articulate what that thing was, um, because good representation is just so simply hard to define. Towards the end of the book, I argue that there's plenty of research and theory and lived experience that indicates that identities are neither wholly internally nor externally defined. Market constructions and social relationships shape audiences, relationships, and interactions with media. How people identify themselves doesn't necessarily define how they identify with characters on the screen. And identification, in turn, doesn't necessarily drive their media consumption, at least not in the ways that um, both scholars and producers often thought that they would. They did talk about the way producers create and shape texts um, that can shape if and how uh, audiences identify with those characters. And I think that one of the things that came out in the book especially is that researchers and creators should be critical of the fact that video game texts which preclude identification with characters, the ones that make players more self-reflexive, are the primary ones in which diversity is more available. For example, one of the things that a lot of people I interviewed talk about is that creating their own character didn't produce identification. They identified as that avatar, perhaps, because they would make it look like them. Or if they created enough of a backstory, they could identify with the character they had created. But when it came to identifying with characters, it was much more about narratively driven preset characters who had a story that was part of the game than it was just self self-reflexive uh, creation of themselves on the screen. Certainly media representation is not only or even always important to people who are marginalized in the same way, and moreover, the political goals of rep representation, sort of this recognition that Dyer is talking about, being able to see others, necessitate that people who aren't members of a marginalized group see representation of marginalized groups. And so in the book, I argue for a third path for representation that gets both it gets us beyond the effects questions, questions of what impact these representations have, as well as pa past marketing justifications. We should represent this group well because we want them to buy our games. And instead, just think about the ways media representation creates what is and might be possible. The issue of representation in games, and indeed all media industries, is too often, I think, focused on what good representation looks like. And those questions are inevitably limiting. Race, gender, and sexuality are not things that are fixable, knowable, static entities that we can pin down and say, that's how it should be represented, that's how it shouldn't be represented. One of the examples I use in my teaching, for example, uh, teaching a lot, and one of the things that Dyer uses as an example is that it is common in media criticism to say representing gay men as effeminate is negative and uh, lesbians as bush is offensive, right? But there are butch women who exist in the world. There are feminine gay men who exist in the world. And automatically assuming that that is bad is denying their existence, as well as critiquing the media text. 
Um, I argue instead that the sort of critical reflection in the creation process is what, what can lead to better representation rather than good representation, right? Good representation necessarily fails to encompass the totality of a group in a single body and recognizes its own failure to do so. That in part simply requires there be more diversity in games in all media, and so single characters aren't bearing the onus of standing in for every person that might share characteristics with that character. And in the end, it's not about a single character, it's not about a single game. It's about all characters in all games and all media, and a much broader picture of what representation looks like. So, after years of trying to explain my book in a soundbite, excuse me, I eventually boiled it down to the following sentence. One, players don't care that much about representation in games. And two, that's a good argument for more diversity in games. And the truth is, that's a bit of a lie on my part. Um, in my research, as I think I explained, I have found not so much that people don't care about representation, but they don't always care in the ways they are expected to care. For it, it is expected, for example, that people who are members of marginalized groups should care about how people like them are represented in media. My interviewees, however, spoke of representation as nice when it happens. They pointed out the many ways uh, representation doesn't matter in games and described the nuanced ways it came to matter. Focusing on when representation of social groups matters, we get a better insight into precisely where contemporary games are lacking in diversity. Moreover, and I've, I've tried to make this point in multiple different ways, I think we can take that argument that representation doesn't matter as a starting point for more diversity. If it truly doesn't matter, um, then why not have more diversity in who is represented and what types of stories are told? If Kratos could be a bunny rabbit, and granted the story might have to be changed a bit, just a little bit, right? Then why not? Why not have bunny rabbits with swords killing harpies instead of Kratos, right? When it does matter, um, people, it turns out, are capable of identifying with a much wider array of characters than we often give them credit for. So both if it doesn't matter to the game, there can be more diversity, and even when it does matter to the game, there can be more diversity, and the, the fear that audiences won't connect with them is, I think, often unfounded. Now shifting to my more recent research, which also began as a project in 2006, which is again a long time ago. It's not that long ago. It is a little long ago. Um, in a project I did back in 2006, I was interviewing people in the games industry and games journalism about the relative lack of LGBTQ content in games. And in doing that, um, I got one reviewer comment from my journal article about that who said, uh, he thought I didn't, I don't know that it was he, just sounded like it. Um, reviewer too thought that I didn't have evidence that there wasn't much LGBTQ content in games. I responded with what was kind of a snarky footnote, but the editor took it and the piece was published, so it's fine. And I argued, I'll read it to you in the, because uh, it's hard to read. Whether there is quantitatively as much representation within video games as other media is an empirical question that I can't address. Um, it's spoken of as though representation in games is lacking. That said, however, given that only 56 video games, C Note 2, which was my list of games, have reportedly have GLBT characters, and even that is a problematic number, um, I'm willing to propose that there's less representation of the GLBT community. This is a long time ago, as you'll notice, terminology changed in video games than other mediums. To fully address this question, however, would require a text-focused study, which is not the task of this project. Now, I waited 10 years for somebody else to do the task uh, that would require the answer to the reviewer's question, but nobody did. So I took it on myself. And over the past year and a half, I, along with some research assistants, some collaborators, and some volunteers, have compiled a website that will eventually document all the games we can find with LGBTQ content. Um, we continue to add games to our main list, which back in 2000, actually 2006 when the research was done, there were only 56 games on the Wikipedia list of LGBTQ characters. Um, when I started doing this project, there were 150. Now we have 488. Um, whenever I get halfway done, we find a bunch more. So I'm never quite more than halfway done. We research each game on the list in depth, write entries for each game, as well as each instance or type of content for the site, and then code that type of content using a tag uh, system on the site. And then we also are doing a larger analysis um, quantitative project as part of the larger uh, research project. Um, 
We also, if any of you are interested in helping out, you can go to the website. Um, you can also find us on Facebook or on Twitter. We need, we are only, uh, we have about 212 games fully researched so far, so we have more than 200 if you want to help out and research those as well. Um, before jumping into some of what we found, I want to sort of explain how we compiled all this information. We started with existing lists, as I say, um, to compile a master list of games with LGBTQ content. The earliest are from the 1980s, which is why that's where the archive starts. If we find games from the 70s, we'll just keep moving backwards. Um, as I said, we have about 488 on the list. This is our giant spreadsheet, or at least the tiny part of it that I can fit into a screenshot. Um, and then we go through each, each one and each example step by step to determine if it constitutes LGBTQ content, queerly read content, misunderstandings, to explain what that content in the game looks like. So here's an example from the 1980s um, I found called It Came From the Desert, listed on the main Wikipedia list of games with LGBTQ characters. Searching for more mentions, I found a Tumblr list of lesbian characters in games. Started looking through reviews and walkthroughs to learn more. Um, found a list of characters finally, and did find a character named Jackie, but couldn't find any characters who any of the character descriptions said were lesbians. Um, finally, I dig, dug a bit more and finally found a long play that I just watched the whole way through, which is about an hour and ten minutes of a very old Amiga game. You're welcome. <laughs> I finally found why people might be reading this character Jackie as a lesbian. These are screenshots. Two are from the long plan, and one is from a walkthrough site. And Jackie says, I was asleep in the backseat of the car when all of a sudden my girlfriend screams, and I hear the car hit something um, and go off the road. Later, a girlfriend's gone, and the car's stuck in the sand. We've got to do something. Now, a little bit of backstory. She and her girlfriend are running away from her boyfriend, who's a mobster, and they stole his car. Little experiment. Based on this text, do you think that Jackie is referring to her romantic partner when she says girlfriend. Raise hands if no. Raise hands if yes. All right. If you raise your hand yes, can you tell me vaguely how old you are? You just be vague. 22. Hmm? 22. 22. Anybody who raised their hand no. Older than 22. See, because this is a generational thing, and this is something I've discovered with my students as well. I watched this in the middle of the night um, when I was doing my research, because that's when I do my research, and I was like, oh, she means girlfriend in the platonic female friend sense that in the 80s and 90s and before straight women tended to refer to their girlfriend as. When I showed it to my, my students, who were much closer to your age, actually much younger, um, they're like, yeah, of course it's romantic, right? And that's because the terminology has shifted. And the terminology of how the term girlfriend is used has shifted over time to the extent that I've, I've seen many a uh, blog online where straight women are complaining that now they can't use the term girlfriend anymore because all the queer women have ruined it for them. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> right? <laughs> but based on the fact that this game is from the 1980s, based on the fact that at the time it was a colloquial term that meant it in a platonic sense, I feel confident in reading in saying that this is a misreading of the term, but that's that requires putting the game in context, right? A game that was produced now that had the same scene, we might read in a very different way. I also um, had to do this for every single game, and also in the context of this game, it's important to point out both she left an abusive boyfriend and then sleeps with the male player character, and that's the extent of her sexuality being revealed in the game. The girlfriend never comes back; she's eaten. It's from 89, so it's not a spoiler. She's eaten by radioactive ants. <laughs> and so we do that for every single game. We go through every single game. And some, the shorter games, a game like It Came From The Desert took about five hours to research. Much bigger games take a lot longer to research. Um, and the archive isn't just about finding characters. It's about finding one-off mentions. It's about finding homophobic jokes or things that are changed in localiz localization or things that are intertextual references or player modifications. Things that are locations like gay bars being in games or gay neighborhoods. Um, optional relationships, actions, including cross-dressing, which um, was such a common action players were required to do, we've made it a separate category. 
And just looking at the last 30 years or so of game, and this is before we added a bunch more games to it, it's very clear that there's been an increase in the number of games and number of examples. But to put this in context, there have been a lot more games in general. right? And we have no good count of the proportion of games to say that this represents X amount of games having LGBTQ content. And we're also pretty sure that all the lists we've started with are in some way incomplete, right? A lot of these are fan-created. When I did this project, when I started this project in 2006, there were 56 games. There are a lot more from the 80s and 90s that weren't on those lists before. A lot of games are discovered um, slowly and over time. But I also don't think that the question of percentage is necessarily what is important here, right? One of the goals of the project is simply demonstrating that LGBTQ content has always been in games. It has always existed in games. Not necessarily a lot, the proportion might um, not be huge, but that it existed matters in and of itself. And related to that, I truly believe that knowing LGBTQ game history can help us make better games, right? Not constantly treating every new game as groundbreaking and surprising, but actually looking back at what history it's tapping into to say, this is why it's breaking from these trends that we've seen in the past. So with the proviso that this is very much a work in progress, I'm going to share with you some trends in LGBTQ representation we've found so far, many of which are funny, I'll tell you that. Um, first, Anyone who's at my Digger talk will know one of these, but any guesses on the top game series um, with the most LGBTQ representation? You just shout them out. Top three, any guesses? GTA? GTA! Yay, yes. GTA is one of them. Local favorite as well. I don't know if it's a favorite, but. <laughs> Other guesses? There's a guess back here from Saints Row. Saints Row? Any others? Saints Row might end up being up there, but so far, the top three are Grand Theft Auto by far, has over 100 examples of LGBTQ content in it. Uh, the Elder Scrolls, um, which we haven't even completely finished researching, but has a ton up there. And then Leisure Suit Larry, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> unexpected, given that it is a game very literally about heterosexuality, right? And yet, because it's a game about heterosexuality, it actually makes a lot of ludic and game mechanic sense that there's queerness in it. I'll get to that um, in a little bit, right? Turning to the game sort of in general, in another part of this project, Evan, uh, oh, no, oh, jumping ahead. Uh, just a note on GTA, because it is from here. Um, well, not here, literally, obviously. Oh. It is, by far, has the largest number of LGBTQ content, and for those who you were, who were at my presentation um, earlier today at the conference, um, I went through more examples of it. But I want to point out that even though all, nearly all of the LGBTQ characters are male, and most of the major ones are white cisgendered men, um, Almost all of the characters as a whole represent a lot more racial and class diversity than any other game series in terms of representations of LGBTQ people. There's nearly one person for every racial group represented in the game series um, who is LGBTQ. Turning to the games in general, Evan Latouri and I have been coding the games to look at sort of quantitative changes over time. And one of the things we discovered is that, well, in the sort of mid to late 80s, all the groups standard started out at pretty equal levels of representation. Over time, gay male representation has sort of exponentially increased. Now, a lot of that might just be an artifact of who's creating the lists. So it's possible that lesbian characters, bisexual characters, like transgender and gender non-conforming characters aren't being included in the fan-created list quite as much as the gay male characters. But it's pretty, a pretty substantial increase. Um, we also uh, code the characters by race or whether or not they're human, and the vast majority are white or non-human. Very few who are um, black, Middle Eastern, Asian, Latino, and Pacific Islander. A lot more who are unknown because race is actually very difficult to determine in a lot of games. And just determining the race of, for example, one character in um, a fantasy star game from the 1980s required two hours of, re of Evan going back into the original kanji to figure out 
what that character's name was meant to translate into in order to uh, vaguely determine that that character was supposed to be read as Italian in a fake version of Italy that exists in the future in a fantasy world. There are, um, most, L most of the LGBTQ characters appear as NPCs, though you do see sort of an increase in the number of playable characters, but also, and this is sort of nice in comparison to trends in other media industries, there aren't as many enemies as you thought. As Evan likes to say, gay people aren't at all bad, right? At least not in games. They often tend to be neutral, non-playable characters. And we use a definition of enemy that includes people who uh, stall your progress, even if they're not actively trying to destroy you. Um, explicitly LGBTQ characters are pretty rare, um, and despite, uh, with the exception of they tend to occur much more in fighting games. Um, and despite the limited representation of bisexuality in games generally, sort of the top four, top five examples anyway, are bisexual characters. Um, Curtis Craig in Phantom's Megoria, Puzzle of the Flesh, Hannah and Rain in Fear Effect 2, Retro Helix, and then Philip, uh, Trevor Phillips in Grand Theft Auto V. Trevor and Curtis, despite being labeled as bisexual in both games, are only ever explicitly shown having sex with women. Um, Hannah's relationship to her partner is only vaguely hinted at in the game, and she at least had a uh, boyfriend in the first game in the series. And then games based on TV shows, comics, and films sometimes translate those characters' sexuality into the game text. So for example, Willow in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Chaos Leads, is a playable character, and they show her relationship to Tara. Um, or others don't reference their sexuality at all. A uh, more recent example is Korra from The Legend of Korra. Part of that is she, her sexuality wasn't really revealed until the finale of the series, but it's not included in the game. The majority of characters um, are non-playable characters, though. And just a few of the sort of random themes of representation from the 80s and 90s include gay cops. An odd but recurring theme. The gay police chief in uh, Gogo Ackman also represents another theme largely appearing in Japanese games, which is leather daddy characters, almost always represented as villains. Um, people are taking pictures, so I will so that, so that. <laughs> Um, leather daddies are almost always represented as villains, as are trans women or cross-dressing men. And this is actually a much more dominant trend, especially in the um, earlier 90s games. Um, there are multiple transgender and cross-dressing villains in games. Nearly always trans women or men dressed as women. There are actually very few trans men represented in games, and even and very rare exceptions, women represented as cross-dressing as men. Um, in addition, there are lots of examples of game plots where the player accidentally sleeps with a woman and then discovers she's trans and freaks out and either loses the game or something bad happens. In terms of queer readings, which is something we're also documenting in the um, archive, not just explicitly coded gay characters, but also characters who have been read by players as queer, are um, potentially lesbian couples or just traveling companions. Um, in the last Express and Gabriel Knight, and actually these two characters it's only, you never really interact with them. It's only if you hover around and listen to all of their conversations that eventually you kind of figure out they might be together, right? These two characters, it's only if you go snooping in the room to look for a clue for one of the um, mysteries you're supposed to be solving that you realize, oh, they're sharing a bed. That could mean anything, right? Maybe they're just saving money. <laughs> in terms of um, uh, gay male characters, there are quite a few examples of characters who might be gay, or just European. <laughs> it's actually... <laughs> a separate side project of this is the ways in, in... I'm looking at the ways in which players especially, what they use to identify whether or not characters are LGBTQ, and codes of Europeanness intersect very closely with codes of homosexuality in the way players are interpreting these games. The other are um, characters who may be gay or may be bishonen, or beautiful boys, a trope of Japanese male representation, most of which are from the Final Fantasy series. I know that that is not a screenshot of the game, but he does appear in the Nintendo 64 game. Um, I've got mad tweets before about the fact that that's not a video game. It is. Um, there are also characters who, gay male characters who are in love with, often unrequited love with the male protagonist such as uh, Tony from Earthbound or Sendak from Bahamut Lagoon. There are many other examples of this, especially in more recent games. 
A lot of the attention, both popularly and academically, has been on LGBTQ representation in terms of same-sex relationship options. Um, in both work I've done with people working in the games industry as well as players, same-sex relationship options are where sexuality is seen to matter in gameplay, right? Who you get to romance is why it matters to the game itself in a sort of non-patronizing, non-tokenizing way. Um, there's a lot of to critique in each individual game's deployment of it, from how many options are available to whether or not it's actually a um, sort of useful deployment of sexuality in terms of representing LGBTQ people to the rest of the world. But one form of representation in particular, in particular troubles me, which is sex workers are often represented as bisexual, which re demonstrates a sort of conflation of sex work with sexual identity. This occurred as early as Ultima 7, the uh, black gate where the bad gypsies were available for uh, hire if you wanted to have sex with them. And often the male uh, sex workers will say, I don't normally have sex with men, but I'll make an exception for money. The only exception I've found is in Fallout 4, there's one male sex worker who only has sex with men. Um, sex workers are also often represented as trans characters, including um, from Grand Theft Auto 5, but it's not, it's not just Grand Theft Auto that represents trans women in particular as sex workers. There are also, as I said already, lots of examples of characters either having to cross for us or having their gender changed without their consent. Um, the Final Fantasy example with Cloud having to dress up as a woman to get into a brothel and then actually being raped in the game, which is something nobody talks about. If you go to the site, you can read that example. Um, the earliest examples are actually from the 1980s and early 1990s. So, this is an example from Leisure Suitler. He's having sex with a woman named Cherry um, backstage and then accidentally puts on her cabaret outfit and, has, and wanders out onto the stage. And in order to get through that uh, level of the game, you have to dance. And anything else you enter, you die of embarrassment. You have to dance and then you get $500 and move on in the game. Um, similarly, to earn money, in um, Space Quest, Ten, Roger Wilco has to dress up as a woman in order to use an ATM card he found. And so you go to this robo boutique and have to put on outfits as a woman. That's uh, Roger in his new drag uh, persona. Other games include what we, I and my research assistants have been calling gay game overs. So in Leisure Suit Larry Six, um, if you flirt with the gay towel, atten towel attendant named Gary, the game ends with an image of the two of them walking off into the sunset saying, what an ignominious end to a swinging career as the ultimate, uh, to a sterling career as the ultimate swinging single. Um, and then in uh, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, which is a full motion video game, if the, if the player character John, who's the plumber wearing a tie, um, ends up romancing the man he's trying to save the woman he's um, after from, the game ends with the two of them walking off together. Cross-dressing and gay game movers are typically used in a pejorative sense, and I think, that, and usually for humor. Um, there are, though, a handful of more positive inclusions, including quests or missions where the player is helping to working to help LGBTQ characters. So, Grand Theft Auto 4 and Grand Theft Auto: The Ballad of Kate Tony have a lot of examples of this. So, you have to kill the hater in Grand Theft Auto um, 4, who's killing gay men in Central Park in the game's equivalent of Central Park. Or in The Ballad of Gay Tony, Clay Pingiver Jackson is a closeted gangster rapper who you escort him and his supposed boyfriend from the club they're performing in back to the hotel and avoid the paparazzi in the meantime. There's also, um, in Divine Dragon Commander, you actually have a policy decision where you get to decide whether or not to allow gay marriage in the game. And then if you decide to allow gay marriage in the game, you later get to decide whether or not gays can serve in the military. I wonder where they got that idea from. Ripped from the headlines. Okay. And although these games are otherwise very heter heteronormative in their plotlines, I think that these rare exceptions show that there are places in which you can include LGBTQ content into the ludic and narrative possibilities of the games that aren't always just marginalizing. Um, moreover, uh, queerness is present in the general atmosphere of the games, even when they don't have LGBTQ characters. So for example, the punny business titles in Grand Theft Auto, um, and gay bars exist as background forms of representation. LGBTQ mentions are often in the form of homophobic or transphobic forms of teasing. So characters are often called gay or asked if they're gay if they're not displaying proper heterosexual behavior. So John in um, 
Plumbers don't wear ties. His mother asks him if he's gay because he doesn't have a girlfriend yet. Um, there's also uh, artifacts in games like the Potion of Transmogrification in Fable 3, Fable 2, um, which you can get at the very after the main game is over, and then it permanently change your, changes your player character's gender. Um, there's also um, traits in some games where uh, Rogue Legacy, you can pick the gay trait, and it only affects the statue of who you're romantically interested in. So, LGBTQ content certainly exists in games. I think we have, we have demonstrated that. Um, but it's not only in characters who are implicitly or explicitly represented as LGBTQ, but also locations players get to visit, actions they can engage in, artifacts encountered in the games. Um, Non-normative gender and sexuality can also be referenced through mentions, often in passing, and traits that PCs can acquire. Um, some games have LGBTQ narratives at their core, um, exploring the lives and experiences of LGBTQ individuals. Many feature homophobia and transphobia, and actually, if, if it were possible, right now the archive represents games with homophobia and transphobia that also have other LGBTQ content. If we lived in a magical universe where we could play every game that ever was created, we could have a better documentation of all of the forms of homophobia and transphobia, but there's only so, much, so many hours in a day. Um, the trends in representation are actually not that similar to trends in or reflective of representation in other media as is commonly expected. One of the things I've talked about before is the fact that um, despite the fact that AIDS and HIV is a common narrative and representations of homosexuality in the 80s and 90s in pretty much every other media, we've only found one free, not very well-known um, Commodore 64 game that references AIDS at all directly, and it's in a very homophobic way. It's called Mad Party Fuckers. I think you can imagine the um, why it's offensive, but I will. I'm happy to tell you in person. I'd rather not repeat the line while being recorded, um, so as not to get that back out in the world. It's not a. Uh, LGBTQ representation is not wholly made up of same-sex romance options or explicitly coded characters, and it's also not as universally negative as we might expect. It also has a long history in games, even ones that aren't necessarily about that, which I think is useful as a starting point. For those of you who were able to see my uh, Grand Theft Auto talk earlier, despite there being a lot of problems in the way LGBTQ content is included in that series, it also demonstrates the ways in which LGBTQ people can be part of the entire world of the game, and not just one-off characters, which tends to be what happens when people are trying to do representation well, oddly enough. So trying to pull together 10 years of research into a single uh, paragraph, um, there are many ways in which I think Gaming at the Edge and the Archives speak to each other, not just because I did them. Um, first, player-customized characters were the ones my interviewees often uh, identified the least with because there was no established character for them to see themselves in. And so clearly there are many games with LGBT. Um, so same-sex relationship options simply can't be the only way queerness gets represented into games. That is an important way to integrate more forms of sexuality into games and more forms of gender into games, but it can't be the only way. There are clearly many games with LGBTQ characters, but the roles they've been given thus far are actually pretty limited, especially when we consider who gets to be the, the, the protagonist in games. Um, but there's some evidence to suggest that it's also not only LGBTQ players who would enjoy playing a game from an LGBTQ character's point of view, and I think that we're at a moment where games can explore that more directly. I think the popularity of, of games like Lim or Dysphoria are a good example of how a game can speak across identity categories, and we don't have to just think about good representation as a way to target specific markets. More than that, though, with the exception of Grand Theft Auto, there are very few series in which queerness becomes part of the very backdrop of the game, an inter integral part of the world created by the game. And I think that um, while GTA might not always do that in the best of ways, it's a good example of the myriad places LGBTQ content could be included into video games. And finally, and in general, I think we can be more attentive to ways representation clearly does matter. So, these are two hugely popular games, Kim Kardashian Hollywood and Pokemon Go. How many of you have played either one of these games? There are a number of people, right? Both of them are built on top of games that were already 
successful, but not nearly wi as widely popular, right? So Pokemon Go is very directly built upon Ingress. Kim Kardashian Hollywood is just a reskinning of Stardom Hollywood. And yet, there's something about the reskinning process in both, in both instances that made them hugely popular, right? So branding is part of that story very directly. Pokemon Go is a decades-old franchise that is um, sort of iconic in a lot of ways. So yes, it's probably more appealing than a new geolocation game. Kim Kardashian is known around the world for better or for worse. So yes, perhaps she is, for whatever reason, someone who can sell this game more directly. But I think the, the fact that these, these games demonstrate something about what is on the screen, shapes whether or not people are called to play it, demonstrates that there are ways representation does matter to the games that we choose to pick up. Um, but I think it's still not always because of the identi identity categories we think of, and I think that games are a good cultural moment to explore the many ways we might connect with characters on the screen with more nuance. To understand with more nuance why Pokemon Go is more appealing than Ingress, why Kim Kardashian Hollywood is more successful than Stardom Hollywood. And I think that um, the question of re representation needs to be on, move beyond questions of what should we do to make good representation and more what can we do to make more kinds of representation. So I will end there. Thank you. choosing to do anything at all is pulling you back from that process of identification because identification is this you see the character is separate from you and you're seeing what they're doing and whether or not you're connecting with what they're doing and I think part of that is um, I started the project without pinning down a specific definition of identification because game studies and media studies generally don't have very many specific definitions everybody uses whatever definition works for what they're doing um, and every time I talked to it, people talked about it. If I, I at, talked about identification, it's been a very long day, um, as a very similar process regardless of medium. And so they could identify with characters in TV shows and movies and books, but in video games, they often felt like they were doing too much to have the moment where they're like, oh yeah, and I'm thinking about what they're doing. So identification for them was often tied to the narrative rather than the choice they got to make. Um, and unless they were sort of role-playing as a character, like the character they created is a character they were, they created a backstory for, which I'll, especially the people I interviewed who worked in theater did that. Um, unless that character they created a story for, the choice wasn't what led to identification so much as the narrative, I think. Thank you. So are you including MMOs in your archive? We are including MMOs in our archive. Okay, I've just I've, I've been thinking through examples all day since I saw your, your talk earlier. I mean, think like Cave from Guild Wars Two, maybe even all of the Silver Age Guild Wars Two, several characters in World of and World of Warcraft. Have, uh, have you already worked on those, and what have you found? We have added Guild Wars. Um, we haven't added, uh, and and one of the final fan the Final Fantasy MMO is also included in it because some of the random NPCs that are generated are also gay, and you can have gay relationship options. We actually have included uh, World of Warcraft just because it hasn't shown on a, up on our list. We have one page on the archive that is entirely academic work about uh, LGBTQ content in games, and nearly all of that is about World of Warcraft, but none of the lists of gay content in games includes World of Warcraft, and so we just haven't gotten to it yet. We also haven't gotten that far into the 2000s yet. <laughs> 
um, because we've mostly, we, I focused on getting the oldest games and working my way up, and everybody else seems to be working at the current games and working their way back down, and so eventually we will just meet in a happy middle. Um, we would love to add World of Warcraft, but nobody sort of pinned down specific things outside of like people forming queer guilds and things like that, and we will include those at some point. I think it's interesting that despite the fact that academics include that game, um, and that's sort of overrepresented in academic work, it's not showing up on the fan lists. And I don't, I have no reason why to give you except that that's true. So that, that actually just made me think of something. And you, and you, uh, I haven't looked through the, the list, even though I have the link, I haven't looked through it extensively. You mentioned that Final Fantasy, um, I'm assuming both 11 and 14, uh, a lot of game areas, I know 11 did that. Um, but uh, since, you, since you included base, and, and, and which included in, in human, mm -hmm. then this is just a purely personal curiosity question. The Gauntlet of Eleven were these were bears, right? Yeah. In a in a, in a, in a, a demographic term, uh, with tails. But they all had big. They were all big dudes with beards. Um, but they reproduced asexually through reincarnation. So, like, does that count as queer content, or does that or like are they? Because I mean, they're they're they are they they're, they have. But they also like have these like very emotional romantic relationships, but that are not sex they're non sexual. And so I mean, it's a, it's certainly a hard hard square to round hole I think. Oh it's not Um I mean it, the 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 goal of the site is not to sort of pin down people into pegs sure. in forcing yeah, any pegs into holes. So that was a dirty place and I didn't mean to but the, I mean, when it comes to the, the quantitative analysis where we're coding people's race, and we're not doing that on the site itself simply because it's so messy, um, it often, it's sort of in the context of the game, is, is this character being coded as human or not human? When it comes to coding sort of um, sexuality more generally, the entries are where we get to get into the nitty gritty of it. I don't think that example is in there, and so if you'd like to contribute that, that would be very helpful. Um, Final Fantasy was a very difficult thing to leap into um, in terms of coding all the content because the examples that are listed in publicly available lists um, are pretty shallow compared to the depth of the kinds of queer content available in that game. There's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, are you guys only looking at uh, like retail versions of games? Because I know like um, the Fire Emblem series, mm -hmm. there's a lot of gay hacks of the game mm -hmm. um, where people are writing relationships and support conversations mm -hmm. between characters that aren't canonically gay, mm -hmm. but now they can be, mm -hmm. um, and like recoding the design of the game so that you can have the children and everything. Um, and that whole thing is like a mess with like five other <laughs> problems that have come up in the most recent one. But I'm just wondering if those kinds of things are also being considered. I know that makes it like way messier. Um, the goal is to be messy. I mean, the, the goal of the site is to include everything, whether it's explicitly in the game or something that audiences have clearly read, we're including modifications. Some of those are much harder to track, simply because they're not as they're not as documented as the the canon version of games. But as um, one of the sort of taglines of the archive could be, we don't care about canon. I mean, we're actually we're much more interested in the interplay between what producers put into the text, what uh, you can read through the text, and then what fans have gone and done with the game, and documenting all of that as part of queer games history, as, a, as opposed to just documenting the explicit content in the games itself, to offer a much wider picture of meaning making that happens through the games. And so, some mods we're able to document, others we haven't gotten to yet, but a lot of that has to do with whether or not there's any if anybody's documented that mod existing in the first place. As a, and that's one of the, um, the difficulties of the project, is documentation. We have an uh, indie game from 1988 called Caper and the Castro that was released as, as uh, freeware, um, or charityware. Anybody who downloaded it was asked to donate that money to the AIDS charity of their choice. Between that game in 1988 and all of the games that came out in sort of 2012 to present, there's no record of indie queer games. Now, I know for a fact that that can't possibly be true, that there were no indie queer games in that time, but people haven't been reporting it. So part of the, the effort is sort of creating queer games history um, and creating a repository for that history, including moms. Hey, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I kind of have a question about okay, so 
She ran the survey initially in 2006, and then obviously in the past 10 years there's been this massive repository built up and you've got a much better idea of representation. What I'm wondering is, I mean, certainly in 2006, like, Tumblr wasn't a thing, none of the Dragon Age games had come out, none of the Mass Effect games had come out, and, and the associated controversies, um, and like a whole Rust thing that only blew up like in the past couple of years, where it kind of from the opposite direction, you've seen that actually some people really, really object to certain yeah. games in university. I'm wondering, do you think if you ran that same initial survey again now, if you would get a very different answer from the LGBTQ demographic, mm -hmm. do you think that people actively seek um, diversity in games in a way that they maybe two, mm -hmm. 10 years ago went, ah, fuck it, whatever, like, we'll, get, we'll, we'll take what we can get, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to push for it because that would be, you know, pointless and, and depressing and, and annoying and mm -hmm. it will make us look like we care, we don't. Mm -hmm. you know, do you think that's different now? Do you think people would give you a different response? Absolutely. Um, have you considered rerunning the survey? Well, so none of my projects have been surveys. They're all interview based. And so doing the interviews again, I just haven't had the, the, the time to do so. But I do, I do actually, um, when, right, the, game, the book came out right after Gamergate. Like, it was, it was literally in production when that started. And that's what happens when you write books. As soon as it goes to production, then something big happens and you can't write about it. So I did write a blog post for uh, the University of Minnesota Press saying that things like I Need Diverse Games, which I'm, I wore my shirt on Monday, so I don't have it now, but go to I Need Diverse Games. I think that demonstrates that people have finally found a space to say they can demand representation from games in a way that wasn't true. I mean, the, the book is based on research that was done in 2009, 2010. I think now, if I had done the same project again, I think I would get different answers. And I think that that's actually, I mean, one of the arguments is that the people I was interviewing didn't feel hailed as a market, and though therefore did not feel they had the right to demand things from the industry. They'd also pretty much given up on the industry. They didn't expect the industry to do better. And I think now, I think that there are still people who, are, who don't expect the industry to do better, but I do think that they've become more empowered to demand that the industry do better. And I think that the, any research coming out post-2014 uh, would probably get people caring more. Or at least, I would imagine so. That's a sort of an empirical question um, that someday I might be able to investigate again. Maybe turn it into a survey. That would be an interesting way to do it more quickly than running around Philadelphia interviewing people in their house. Also, for people who do interview research, if you are allergic to any animals, <laughs> everybody you interview will have that animal. <laughs> Other questions? So just a small comment on much of your question. Um, a friend of mine once brought up um, a really interesting commentary on the choices of uh, races in the D&D video games, in that you tend to play the mainstream, so the human elf, half-elf, wolf, half -elf. Um, and you get draw, you get the usual kind of popular, exquisite races, but never like the other ones. And it's kind of interesting, like some developers do choose to let you play something like, I don't know, Lizardman, mm -hmm. um, Naga, or something like that, that generally is the most mainstream. Mm -hmm. And um, he kind of associated it as a, you know, it shouldn't be, like, sure, we, we should have diverse um, cast of races, but it shouldn't just for the sake of popular diverse cast, but you should do it in a way, in his words, that. Um, make it as um, accessible, but also make the choice as wide as possible because adding one extra race shouldn't be that much work, in his opinion. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a parallel between that and um, look, just looking at LGBT um, diversity representation or any other representation where companies choose to you know, just pick the, like you said, marketing, try to reach out more, but mm -hmm. what, what else can they do besides reach out to the modern community? Is that a response to? Uh, it actually makes me think of a comment a, a student in a class that she taught last fall said is that often a lack of diversity is, is a lack of creativity. Like, I mean, like, if, how do you write a lizard man character? Right? Like, that's like, that, like, what's the like, what's the, the ideal form, right, of representation of a lizard man character? Like, I don't know. I, don't know. Like, I mean, I think that's one challenge to think grapple with. Like, I'm with you. Like, I, I think they should. But, like, I think, I think that might be. And I think the, the, the problem is sort of the, the approach to the question in the first place, right? So is it, are you including diversity just for the sake of including diversity? Or did you actually imagine a world that was diverse? 
And that those are two very different approaches, right? If you have a cast of like five characters for a fighting game and you're like, oh, we should probably have a girl, and we should probably have someone who's not white, right? Then yeah, that's going that's one, it's tokenism and the, the idea that you're creating those because maybe on occasion when a girl stumbles into an arcade, she'll want to play a girl character, right? If that's the thing that you're imagining then you're not actually imagining how that character functions in that world. As opposed to saying, let's imagine a world, and then start to populate that world with characters. I think games that are based in reality, things like Grand Theft Auto, are actually have it easier in that sense, that they have a world to pull on, that you're not starting completely from scratch. But a lot of the fantasy games that exist, the queer characters, if they're there at all, sort of are the only ones, right? You have a cast of characters and a gay best friend, and no other gay people in the entire universe. Right? That's pretty lonely. But that's, I mean, that's what all media do. do. And actually, uh, Liz Bird, who's a media anthropologist at University of South Florida, has a great um, case study of this, where she broke, uh, she was in Minnesota at the time, and she broke uh, focus groups into three different groups, one group entirely white, one group entirely Native American, and one group mixed, and asked them to create a show pilot off the top of their head that had to include white and Native characters and at least um, one male and one female character. The white people uh, group made a game, made a TV show where a wise Native American woman came in and like solved all the white people's problems. <laughs> the Native American uh, focus group created a show set on a reservation where occasionally white people stumbled in and did stupid things. <laughs> and the mixed group never made a pilot. They spent the entire time talking about representation with each other and saying, why can't I show it that way? Why would that be problematic? Oh, I didn't realize saying that would be offensive to you. And then they just talk about white and native people relations for the rest of the time, right? And I think, I mean, it is not enough to just create a diverse team and assume that people who are members of groups can somehow magically make your game better. But diversity does produce those conversations, at the very least. Assuming that people, I mean, um, assuming that people have good politics anyway. That's a really good story. I just want to kind of quickly go back to the previous point. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking not only just the lack of representation in some ways, it, whether that's for the sake of it or um, in a more uh, not good but in your words, um, what I was thinking also representation of um, diverse communities. That's something that's uh, quite lacking. Like you said, mm -hmm. you have a great, great character and that's like a universal mm -hmm. universe. And um, when you were talking about MMOs, that's like pretty much the only other example besides the big clubs and Flight in GTA, um, there's no really other like your queer companion would just be themselves and somehow they've worked through whatever life story and then they are not have any other communities to fall back to. And I wonder, have you seen any um, other communities in terms of representations like that? Hmm. I'd have to think harder on it. I mean, Aside from games being produced by queer people and largely indie games, no. I mean, but a lot of those games, like, I mean, Caper and the Castro is very clearly said in the Castro, it's about a queer community. Um, but in terms of a more mainstream game, there are couples. So, like, the, the best option is that gay people exist as couples. Often lesbians exist as couples, gay men exist as stereotypes. Um, is another common finding, it didn't make it into the slideshow. Um, but in terms of entire queer communities existing within the game, not so far. But something for people, for the game makers in the audience to perhaps pursue. Right. Other questions? Um, just comparing Grand Theft Auto against Legacy Larry, which was a the dark horse I didn't expect. In your research, have you looked at the relative development power that went into making those games more diverse. You know, comparing, say, Grand Theft Auto, where adding some different voice lines for policemen mm -hmm. is relatively easy given the size of the production, whereas for Legends of Larry, it's a tiny team. I mean, and in the, the original Legends of Larry, it was two people, right? I mean, for the first few games, it was a, like it was literally one person writing and one person doing the art, and that was pretty much who made the game, um, because they didn't want to invest that much money in the game because they thought it was going to be a massive failure. Um, showed them. <laughs> um, but in terms of the real, I mean, there is a later stage of the project where we'll be looking into sort of the each game and the, the context of production and ideally interviewing people. So if anybody here knows anybody who's worked on a Grand Theft Auto game, I'd really like to talk to them as soon, even in private, um, 
with all anonymity, etc. Um, but the when it comes to both of those games, they do share a very similar sense of humor in terms of the we're being offensive and therefore no one should take offense. And I think that the sort of shared worldview and shared humor in that sense sort of transcends the different um, production powers. I mean, for a game like Grand Theft Auto, it could have been a one-off artist who put in that punny title who thought it would be funny, right? It occurs so often in the game that it, it clearly wasn't just one person, but it is it could have been much more easy to imagine somebody sort of sneaking that representation in versus a game that's very clearly has an author and an artist behind it like Leisure Suit Larry does. But I think the sort of the impact of the representation is the same regardless in a lot of ways. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I, think I, um, I was just thinking, uh, what are your expectations for the future of, the, of uh, at least the mainstream games industry? when it comes to representations of yeah, intersecting identities. And I think that, um, I think it's impossible to make games today and not be aware of questions of representation. So I do think that increasingly companies will, the certain companies that are invested in doing so will create one-off good characters. My hope is that they start creating more diverse universes, right? Because we see a lot of companies which will make a very well-researched, very heavily, uh, consulted character, but that's the only character. And I think part of what I would like to see is people imagining sort of the world they've created more than try not to get in trouble with that one character. Because the more characters you have, the more diverse kinds of people they can be, right? Even if they're all members of the same group, you can have much more diversity in the kinds of subject positions they have. You can have much more diversity in the types of roles they play in the game, um, which Grand Theft Auto actually manages to represent despite all of its problems. And I think that's sort of the, that's the next goal. Not just imagining how queer people can play queer people in games, but imagining that queer people are part of the universe of the games that are being created. And uh, just to follow up on that, what, what do you think is required to reach that uh, goal? I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I, I'm not naive. I think that companies seeing as profitable is what's required to, to reach that hope. But I think also seeing the, also turning that on its head and seeing that doing it isn't necessarily not profitable, right? And I think that that's sort of the shift that you're starting to see, but the assumption that people will not mag magically boycott your game, or not, not enough people will magically boycott your game because you included a gay neighborhood in it where there were queer people who weren't awful. Um, that, that requires a mad, I mean, I think, in 2009, in the putting in the game game piece, I said one thing that would be required to have more diversity of LGBTQ representation was an expanded indie sphere. And hey, that worked out. I never make predictions, but I'm glad I made that one, despite that reviewer, right? And I think that having more platforms and more distribution channels is one of the key ways to do it, because main, major companies will never take on that risk. And that's true of all media industries. And I think we're done. All right. Thank you.